hello. Welcome to Stanford's CARES monthly community health talk series. My name is Dr. Jisun Hong. I'm a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Immunology and Rheumatology at Stanford and tonight's moderator. I'm pleased to bring you the series of talks co-sponsored by Stanford Health Library and Vincent V. C. Wu Foundation. I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Albert Wu, who will be speaking on site-threatening diseases in the Asian community. This topic is important to know what diseases are particularly prominent in the Asian community, what one should look for, and how to prevent these diseases. He will discuss the most common site-threatening diseases in the Asian community. Dr. Albert Wu is a board-certified ophthalmologist and a fellowship-trained specialist in oculoplastics and orbital surgery, also known as ophthalmic plastic <clears throat> and reconstructive surgery. This specialty is dedicated to care of the eyelid and other structures around the eye. Dr. Wu focuses his expertise on saving people's vision. He provides comprehensive, compassionate care for both adults and children with sight-threatening diseases and injuries of the eye and surrounding area. He treats tearing, eyelid drooping, thyroid eye disease, eyelid tumors, and other facial disorders. He also performs facial rejuvenation as well as reconstructive and aesthetic surgery procedures. Dr. Wu is a national leader in advancing the use of stem cell therapy to treat conditions involving the eye and face. His research explores how stem cells can regenerate a patient's own tissues for potential transplant. His goal is to make regenerative medicine an accepted treatment for people worldwide suffering from diseases of the eye. The, Nas the National Eye Institute funded Dr. Wu's research to develop stem cell therapies to treat corneal blindness and regenerate the surface of the eye. He leads the Stanford Ophthalmic Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Laboratory and is developing leading edge te uh, technology and treatments for vision loss and eye disease. With this, I turn it over to Dr. Wu to begin tonight's talk. Well, thank you very much uh, and good evening. Thank you, Dr. Hong. First, I'd like to thank the organizers of CARE for inviting me to uh, talk to you tonight. And hopefully uh, over the course of about a half hour, I can bring you up to speed on some of the major site-threatening illnesses in the Asian community. So I will share my screen. So for tonight's uh, presentation, I'm really hoping to give a, uh, a very useful and uh, kind of a whirlwind tour of some of the major diseases affecting the Asian community. Um, what I will focus on is actually the diseases that are more common in Asians. Uh, and we will hit upon the most common diseases that we find in the community. But I will leave out a few things that we can circle back around at the end if there's time, including macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. Both of those are very common. But I'm gonna hit upon these first, and then we'll hopefully have time to hit upon the other things. So let's jump right in. Myopia. Now, myopia, otherwise known as nearsightedness, is incredibly common. It is actually thought of, uh, the World Health Organization has called it an epidemic because of the sheer number of people affected. And not just in Asia, but worldwide. But it has taken uh, really a, a, front, a front seat in Asia because of so many people who have it. In, uh, in our youth, over 80% have nearsightedness. And we can see this when we look in our high schools and junior highs, where in Asia, almost everyone is wearing contacts or glasses. And uh, in a study done looking at Korean, uh, Taiwanese, Chinese, looking at the total comers, the number is somewhere about between 84 and 97% that, that need glasses. So it's an incredibly high number. And what's even more scary is that the number is increasing. So if we look at the predicted numbers of patients or of our children, our youth, who will need glasses or some sort of uh, myopia treatment, it is going up. And not just in the myopic uh, category, but in the area we call high myopia, very nearsighted. And what is increasing this, uh, this epidemic? Well, it's thought there's a shift. And just uh, over the course of uh, 100, maybe 200 years, we've moved from a, uh, a society uh, in rural areas to urban. And then certainly in Asia with increased 
uh, academic pressures, schoolwork, telephones, tablets, etc., and the fact that our youth are spending time indoors rather than outdoors, all of these things are thought to increase the risk for nearsightedness, the need for glasses. Now, I think many of us can or know people who wear glasses or we wear we have worn glasses ourselves. What what happens? Well, you can't see things far away. Children in the class, in the back of the class, are raising their hands. Everything's blurry. They need to be moved up to the front. And when you're watching TV or you're watching a movie, you can't see the faces of the people. Or if you're in the theater or a museum, difficulty to see far away. And that can lead to headaches, eye strain, squinting. And this is a major, major problem. Risk factors include certainly near, near work, those with higher education, that's kind of an association. And then certainly it's thought that urbanization plays a role in this epidemic of nearsightedness. What are the causes? Well, genetic is certainly a factor. We know that if both your parents wore glasses, very likely that you will wear glasses or you are, uh, that you will need glasses. If uh, both parents have uh, good vision, don't need glasses, less likely that you will need it. Environmental factors are not fully clear, but it's certainly thought that the things I mentioned uh, play a role near work, uh, lighting, exercise, a few other things. And really what is the cause uh, of it is, is really unclear. And that is why it's one of the major areas of research, both for NIH and for the World Health Organization to understand what is causing this epidemic of myopia. Now, why do you not see far? Well, if you look at this picture, myopia is really uh, because during development, as a, as a baby developing until about 20, 25 years of age, your eyes changing and growing. And the size of the eye is actually too long. So you can think of a normal eye about somewhat spherical, uh, like, a, like a ball, but the myopic eye, the nearsighted eye, is very much like a football. It's too long. It's oblong. And what that means is that the front of the eye, the cornea and the lens that focuses the light onto the retina, as shown, as shown here, the light should focus right on the retina. Just like if you had a magnifying glass and you're trying to shine that, that, the sun onto a, a point. But for myopic eye, for the, the myopic eye, it is focused in front of the retina. And when you wear glasses, it moves that focus back onto the retina. So it's not clear why as you develop, especially in Asians, the eyeball is too long. How do we diagnose this? So we do a basic eye exam. We do a refraction, which is changing the lens power to see what lens power perfectly uh, focuses the light onto the retina. And then there are certain imaging things we can do, look in the back of the eye and certain machines that we use that allow us to look at the back of the eye, which is the retina. Now, if the eye is too long and oblong, like a football, then the retina, which is a thin neural uh, layer on the back of the eye, has a higher risk of kind of peeling off and coming off the back of the eye. Think of the retina almost like uh, wallpaper. And if you pulled the wall and you change the shape of the wall, the wallpaper may come off the back of the wall. What that causes, those little breaks and changes can cause a retinal detachment where the retina comes off the back of the eyeball. And that those little bit of breaks can also cause new blood vessels to grow. And that's why there are no, numerous types of treatment to address high myopia when that happens. Now, for those of us who wear glasses, we know that's a treatment for nearsighted nearsightedness. And that's been around for hundreds of years with the very, very basic first glasses. Contact lenses, certainly. And in the past 20, 30 years, amazing laser eye therapy, where we can change the shape of the cornea so that the light is, refract is refracted perfectly again onto the back of the eye, LASIK or PRK, different forms of laser eye surgery that I'm also happy to chat about at the end. There are certain candidates that are good, and then certain people who are not so good candidates for laser eye therapy. And then there are potential future treatments. Uh, gene therapy, things are on the pipeline that hopefully can change the shape of the eye so that our youth and our children, when they grow, 
they will not need glasses in the future. So now let's change, uh, change a little bit to angle closure glaucoma. Now, glaucoma is one of the leading causes of blindness worldwide. But not everyone goes blind from glaucoma. Many people can lose vision, and some people can hold it off where they have no vision loss. Now, I'm going to talk about angle closure glaucoma. It's one type of glaucoma. There are many other types of glaucoma, but angle closure is particularly notable in the Asian community. When you look at all patients that have angle closure glaucoma in the world, 80% of them are in Asia. So there's a definite propensity for the Asian community. Angle closure glaucoma is called this type of glaucoma because the angle is closed. And if you look at the picture here and you look at my mouse, the angle we're talking about is the angle of the cornea and the iris. So I'm kind of outlining that angle. It's an acute angle. And what happens is that the iris or parts of the iris will move forward and obstruct the outflow pathway of fluid from the eye. So that brings us back to what is glaucoma. Well, glaucoma is a optic nerve damage. So light shines into the eye and the retina senses the light and sends the signal, whatever picture you see when your eyes are open to the back of the, the head, to the brain, and you see your image. So you can think of the optic nerve as the cable that sends the image to your brain. Glaucoma causes damage to that cable, to the optic nerve. It is known that increased pressure in the eye. So the eyeball, you can think of it, it's about the size of a large, large grape. It needs pressure to stay and maintain its shape and to function, like a water balloon. If you have a lot of water in it, it can blow up the water balloon to its correct size. If there's not enough, it will sag and deflate. And if there's too much, it can cause pressure and can, well, not really pop, the eye doesn't pop, but it can cause pressure and damage to the back of the eye. There's constant fluid made in the eye, and then there's always a fluid egress or fluid outflow. If the fluid cannot leave the eye well, then there will be an increased pressure in the eye and glaucoma will form. So what are the symptoms of angle closure glaucoma? Well, you'll have blurred vision, potentially pain, halos, redness, and then in very severe cases, nausea and vomiting. Now, unlike other forms of glaucoma, which often have a high constant pressure in the eyeball, angle closure causes spikes and very high pressures all of a sudden. You can think of this a little bit like blood pressure. When you go into the doctor's office and they check your blood pressure, it could be normal or it could be high. For angle closure glaucoma, when you go to the eye doctor, they'll measure the pressure in your eye, but it may be normal. For angle closure glaucoma, you have spikes during certain times of the day, and those increases in pressure are what causes the damage to the optic nerve. So it's very important that this is known in the community because often patients will go into their eye doctor, have a normal eye pressure, but then they'll go home and notice severe pain, redness, all the things I mentioned here, and they have angle closure glaucoma. What are the risk factors? Certainly genetics, if your parents had it. Females, much more common than males, as shown in the, in the diagram. Uh, ethnicity and then shape of the eye. Certain shapes of the eye have uh, higher risk for angle closure glaucoma. And as I mentioned before, and this is shown in schematic, that the iris is shown in green, the, the cornea shown as the, as the outer layer, and my arrow is pointing to where the fluid will, will flow out. And that's shown over here as well on the left. If you look at my mouse, the fluid will flow out of the eyeball in front of the iris and behind the cornea. How do we diagnose this? Well, you go to the doctor's office, ophthalmologist's office, they take a history and they are concerned. So you get an eye exam and we do a number of things to make sure that we can measure the pressure correctly, such as the thickness of the cornea. And we know that in glaucoma as shown down here, the increased pressure in the eyeball will cause damage potentially to the optic nerve and retina. What are the treatments? Well, as I mentioned before, that the iris can bow forward and obstruct the outflow of fluid from the eyeball. This is where all the fluid leaves the eye through two structures. Well, it's a circular structure around the eye. What we do is a small laser therapy. It's largely painless. 
and we create a small pin-sized hole in the, in the iris. This allows fluid to flow between the hole and decreases any pressure behind the iris that might cause it to bellow forward and obstruct the angle of the, of the, uh, of the eye here and obstruct the fluid outflow. In addition, there are medications and treatments that we can give to decrease the pressure and stop the blockage and stop the glaucoma. Okay, let's switch gears once again. Cataract. Now, cataract is the most, one of the most common causes of visual disability worldwide. And it is more common in Asians and occurs more early, earlier in Asian patients. I think everyone has heard of cataracts largely because it is thought to be a normal, in some ways, a normal course of aging. Cataract is when the lens of the eye uh, becomes uh, not clear, opaque. So in a normal individual, you see that the light will nicely go through the eye as shown in the bottom here. But with a cataract, you can think that the lens has become white and light no longer goes through easily. What are the beginning symptoms of cataracts? Well, you have cloudy, fuzzy, foggy vision, glare. Um, so if you look at a light, it'll look like that. It won't look pinpoint and bright. You might have a prescription change. And then as, as a result, you may have sec what we call second sight. Second sight is typically when the cataracts form and that change in opacity in the, uh, in the lens will actually change your prescription. And if you're nearsighted or farsighted, you might see actually a little bit better for a short period of time before the cataract becomes severe. What are the risk factors? Well, aging is the main one. Almost every person in the world will develop cataract over time. It might be in your 50s or 60s. It might be in your 80s, 90s, or above. But by and large, most patients have cataract surgery to remove the uh, opaque lens, usually between the age of 60 and 80. Aging, diabetes, uh, family history, and all the things I list here are all risk factors and potential causes for a cataract. How do we diagnose this? Well, if we shine a light into the eye, we can see an opaque whitish uh, lens. There are a number of tests that we can do to monitor and how bad the cataract is. And what is the mainstay of uh, treatment? Well, the lens is in the eyeball, it's held in place, and what we can do as ophthalmologists is we make a small incision into the eye, very, very small, and we can remove the uh, opaque cataract, which is a opaque whitish lens. And we put in an intraocular lens. It's a lens that goes in the eye. It's very, very small, about, uh, about, the, about maybe a quarter inch, maybe a little bit bigger, and it's clear. And this will go in the place where the old lens was, and uh, it takes about 20 minutes to, to occur with, uh, you with you awake. Of course, we can give you some sedation so they're nice and comfortable, but this is done by the ophthalmologist in the operating room and takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do routinely. Uh, there are a number of visual aids and uh, it is, uh, well, what I mean by visual aids is afterward, uh, it, there are a few things we do to make sure that the, that the surgery went well, and it's largely elective surgery. Uh, people will schedule it, it's day surgery, you'll come in and you'll often leave the, the uh, ambulatory surgery center the same day within about two to three hours after surgery. So we can cure blindness from cataract in about half hour. I'm happy to talk more about cataract at the end as well. Okay, so now we're going to segue into an area that is slightly more rare. These are more rare conditions not totally uncommon, but they're much more common in the Asian community. And I'm gonna hit upon four or five of these things that are somewhat more uncommon, but certainly we wanna get the word out in the Asian community. One of them is called central serious serous chorioretinopathy. It's a kind of a long term, we often call it CSC or CSR, central serous retinopathy. And it uh, is a fluid accumulation behind the retina. It's more common in men, about six times, and typically around uh, a male in the age of 40s. But it's, it can happen in, in, uh, in women and in various ages, but mainly in that age group. Uh, what are the symptoms? Well, 
often it'll be a smudge or a gray spot in the vision. Typically it's one eye and it's typically uh, painless. As, as I mentioned, more common in males than females. And it's not truly understood what causes it. There's certain uh, associations. Uh, one is stress. Um, it's been linked to what they call type A personality, people who are very driven, uh, very pressured, stressed. Uh, certainly steroids can uh, be a risk factor as well, uh, but it's not fully understood what causes it. And how do we diagnose it? Well, patients come in often with this diagnose with this with these symptoms. And when we look at the back of the uh, of the eye, the retina, we see a little bit of fluid that has accumulated behind the macula. So uh, showing here, this is what we call a optic coherence tomography. It's a like an ultrasound of the eyeball, and it allows us to see fluid and other um, echogenic uh, structures in the in the eye in our with our ultrasound. And what we find is there's a little bit of fluid right behind the retina. And uh, how do we treat it? Well, it's interesting. Uh, there's been a connection with steroid use, but there are certain steroids that we can use around the eye that will help it potentially clear. Often, many patients we leave alone, especially if uh, their vision isn't uh, very badly uh, compromised. And then there are some laser therapies that we do to help dry up that fluid if it re uh, remains for usually longer than a month or two. Okay, the next uh, topic is something called polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. Now, often in ophthalmology, we have these very long names that are very confusing. Well, this one is like macular degeneration, and it's often confused with macular degeneration, which is very, very common. And it's thought to be perhaps a subset and related to macular degeneration. Well, to break it down, polypoidal is that there are little polyps essentially in the, in the vasculature, the blood vessels of the eye. It's related to the choroid, which is the uh, collection of blood vessels behind the eyeball. And it's thought to be a, what we call a vasculopathy or a pathology of the blood vessels. So it's a problem of your blood vessels behind the eye. It is common. It's prevalence of about 22 to 61% among Asians, depending upon which population of, of Asians. And it's two to three times more common than in the Caucasian population. And let's, let's talk a little bit about it. Um, the symptoms are like macular degeneration because the retina is affected. So you have blurred, diminished vision. Uh, you see spots potentially in your vision, shadows. And the risk factors are age, uh, uh, more common in, uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the uh, female population, I believe, for uh, polypoidal, unlike central serous. And then smoking is another factor. And when you look closely, and just to show you a little bit of the polyps, you have the uh, blood vessels here shown, and this is a what we call an ICG. It's a, um, a, a stain that allows us to look at the blood uh, vessels in the back of the eye. And we could see little polyps that have formed and potentially little areas of bleeding in the back of the eye. And this is shown as well in the ultrasound. Again, this is a picture of your retina. And this black area is showing fluid that has accumulated behind the, the retina. And this is a, a picture, a photograph, again, showing fluid accumulation behind the retina. We know it's behind the retina because we can see it's behind the blood vessels. If the blood or the fluid is in front of the blood vessels, then we know it's either somewhere in front of the retina. And then we can see little polyp, polypoidal, polypoidal a filling of fluid in the back of the eye. So these are all methodologies that we can use to diagnose and know that this is indeed uh, polypoidal. What are the treatments? Well, um, it, unfortunately for poly polypoidal, um, often when the damage is done, there's not much we can do. We can try to halt and, and just like macular degeneration, often we try to halt the damage that's been done. We can give uh, what we call VEGF or vascular growth factor. So uh, growth factors that cause blood vessel growth. We can try to stop blood vessel growth and we can also uh, treat with laser. Okay, so now let's take another pivot to something that we call sarcoidosis. So sarcoid is a inflammation. Um, it is not well understood. It's a systemic illness. 
but it can definitely affect the eye. So I'm going to talk about how it affects the eye. Now, this, now ocular sarcoid is more common in the Asian community. We don't fully understand why that's the case for ocular, um, but it can cause problems throughout the body. And often we'll get referrals from our great colleagues over in rheumatology <laughs> um, for patients that have, uh, or, or they're concerned that they have sarcoid. And there are a few ways to, to diagnose this, but to diagnose it. But before I get there, by and large, it can affect all many parts of the body, but when it affects the eye, it can cause dry eyes, blurring vision, a blurring of vision and itchy burning eyes. And these are some pictures of patients that have um, sarcoid. Particularly for the eye, it can affect the conjunctiva, which is kind of the area I'm, I'm pointing to here. It's actually the clear part in front of the white part of the eye. It's, you can think of it uh, as the skin, uh, the thin, very thin skin of, the, of this part of the eye. And it can also affect the tear gland, what we call the lacrimal gland. And the, when if it affects the lacrimal gland or the conjunctiva, the clear part here, that is what often causes the symptoms we see in our patients. And again, the, the risk factors race. It's actually very, uh, it's very common in African-American and uh, those from African descent but also in Asian patients, gender is a factor and family, family history. And the causes, we don't fully, fully understand what causes sarcoid, but if you look worldwide, certainly you could see in the dark area, uh, highly affects uh, those in, from African descent, but also those of Asian descent as well. And it's a challenging disease because we don't fully understand what causes it. So often when we, don't know what, it, what is causing uh, a patient's symptoms that we want what we call a tissue diagnosis or a tissue, we'll do a tissue biopsy. Because when we look at the, uh, the lesion, the abnormal area under the microscope, we can see uh, little areas of granuloma formation, and that can allow us to diagnose that there, it is indeed sarcoid. And what we do is we'll take potentially a lacrimal gland biopsy, uh, these are surgeries that I do. We make a small incision above your eyebrow, and we can do this in the clinic, and it'll take us about 15, 20 minutes. We take a little bit of your lacrimal gland away from the area that is uh, producing tears. So often, 95% of the time, this causes no impact on your tearing. A few patients, it will cause some dry eye. And then we can also sometimes see a formation, a granuloma formation uh, in the conjunctiva. And when we see this, this is very straightforward. Also, we can put in a few drops of preparacaine, a few drops of anesthetic, or a little small injection on the side of the eyelid, and we can take a biopsy that way. Again, a five, 10 minute uh, type of procedure that allows us to diagnose uh, what uh, the patient may have. Uh, the treatments are, are long, are poten uh, potentially, uh, there are a lot of new treatments for this. Um, but suffice it to say, there are certain things that can suppress the immune system, steroids and other uh, agents that can treat this entity. Um, there are two other uh, diseases that I'm gonna very briefly talk about, largely because they're somewhat uncommon. One is called uh, Voit uh, uh, Kayanaji Harada, we call it VKH, and the other is called Bichette's, and they're both Quite, quite rare diseases, and, but they do cause uh, what we call a uveitis, and, and as does sarcoid. And these three, VKH, Bichette's, which I'll talk about later uh, or next, and sarcoid, are, can cause what we call non-infectious uveitis. Now, what is uveitis, this word I've written over here? Well, the uvea is, is thought to be part of the eye. It's largely the everything kind of between the a cornea and the retina. So that includes the ciliary body that produces the fluid in the eye, the iris, uh, the uh, parts of the lens, and um, the, the um, part of the, uh, the sclera can also be considered, the inner part can be considered part of the uvea. And the itis part is an inflammation. So VKH is somewhat rare, but it's certainly more common in Southeast Asian populations and East Asian populations. And it can also be found in uh, Amerindian population and Hispanic populations. So what do we see? Well, these patients can have eye pain, fever, headache, vertigo, orbital pain as listed here. 
And all of this is done due to an inflammation. Just like if you have a tennis, tennis elbow and it's inflamed and can be painful, the eye can become painful from inflammation. Risk factors, not again, well understood, but there is a connection with those who have uh, more pigment, more melanocytes, so darker skinned individuals, as well as those with certain uh, genetic, um, uh, certain blood types and uh, H, what we call HLA factors, so certain genetics. Causes, again, as I mentioned, unknown, but people have an abnormal immune response and there can be uh, certain problems in the eye. Again, I'm focusing on the eye part, uh, but other connections are certainly uh, that they're that they may have skin lesions and potentially uh, other problems like that related to the eye. Visual, uh, we check their vision, we do a clinical exam, and uh, we do imaging. And when we look at the back of the eye and we see inflammation and we see the changes that are characteristic of EKH, again, we go to our uh, uh, steroidal or immunosuppressive treatment, and we refer our patients to our rheumatology colleagues because often these patients require high dose therapy and systemic therapy to, uh, to save their vision and to maintain their vision. So this is something we do hand in hand with our rheumatologist colleagues. And Bichette's is very similar to VKH, so I'm going to buzz through it very, very quickly. More common in our Middle Eastern uh, and kind of Asian populations, uh, that will have Bichette's. Again, it's a uveitis that can affect the front and the back of the eye. And uh, it's something that we, certainly we like our Asian communities to know about uh, because it's something more common in these communities. Same thing, tearing, pain. Uh, and for this particular entity and for VKH, sometimes we have what we call a hypopion. So a complicated word for white blood cells that are in the front of the eye. And sometimes we even see patients come in with a little bit of, of uh, a fluid line. So there's a whitish milky material right at the bottom of their eye as, as I'm outlining with my mouse. And those are white blood cells. So the immune system is reacting and all those blood cells are by gravity pooling at the bottom. That's how, how inflamed the eye can be. And if we look at the prevalence uh, Bichette was a Turkish uh, ophthalmologist who, who described this entity. So many, many of these patients in Turkey, but also uh, in the Middle East and in Asia, but also worldwide. The causes not fully understood. There are some connections to some infectious uh, etiologies, genetic, environmental, but again, not, not well understood. And we do very similar tests. We uh, refer our these patients to our colleagues as well in rheumatology. Um, and uh, the treatments for the eye, often steroidal uh, treatments for the eye and systemic treatments as well. So in 30 minutes, we've uh, really had a, a whirlwind tour of the most common ocular diseases, uh, particularly in Asians, uh, macular degeneration, and diabetic retinopathy, many, many times more common than Bichette's and uh, VKH that I mentioned. So I'm happy to chat about those as well, certainly if there are questions. Um, we've gone through what are the common symptoms, risk factor causes, diagnoses, and treatments for these uh, ocular diseases. And we will see changes with time, just like myopia is getting worse. Uh, it is thought that in Asia, uh, diabetes will be 200 times more common uh, in the next uh, 20 years. So we're going to see much more diabetic retinopathy and entities like that. So as an ophthalmologist and kind of some closing thoughts, please, if you have any eye problems, see an ophthalmologist or an op optometrist, get an eye exam. People will often ask me, how often should I, ha I haven't had an eye exam, five, 10 years. Uh, my vision is fine. You know, should I go in? And I, I recommend if certainly if you have a family history, you have an uncle or a parent or a grandparent who had glaucoma. Um, if uh, you have uh, any family history of eye problems, go in, have an eye doctor, take a look at your eyes. Um, I would recommend every three years minimum. If you're generally healthy, that's pretty good. If you have other problems like high blood pressure, diabetes, all these things, you should be getting a yearly eye exam uh, to make sure that there's nothing going on there. So to conclude, I'd like to acknowledge uh, 
Reza Ashrari. He's a undergraduate at Cornell. He helped me with his presentation. He's interested in ophthalmology. And here's a list of my references. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, I've included my email here. Uh, if people want referrals or anything like that, I'm more, ha more than happy to facilitate that. We have a wonderful department uh, in, uh, at Stanford, and we'd love to see you. So thank you. Dr. Wu, thank you so much for such a great comprehensive talk. You really covered a lot of topics today, uh, going from really common things to some of the more rare things, which are actually quite common to me. So um, we'll start with some uh, pre-submitted questions uh, that came in before the talk. Um, let's see, our first question. Is glaucoma, which is discovered in later years, so those uh, 80 and over, 80 years and over, hereditary to younger middle-aged children? Yeah, that's a great question. When glaucoma occurs late, often it will have, let's just say, little impact on the patient themselves. So glaucoma, not to um, uh, belittle it per se, but it usually takes between 10 and 20 years of high pressure, again, it depends on how high, to cause optic nerve damage. So if we diagnose someone in their 80s, um, oftentimes we will say, okay, we could treat it. Sometimes we don't need to treat it, especially if the pressure is borderline, it's a little bit of glaucoma, and it will not impact that, patient's, that patient in their lifetime. But your particular question about the, the children, it really has to do with what causes the glaucoma. We do know that as the eye ages, sometimes uh, just like many parts of the body can kind of break down. And if the glaucoma we think is related to aging and not genetic factors, then by and large, it will not affect the children. But there are known uh, genetic factors, certain genes that have been associated with the glaucoma and it's possible to test for them. It's rare to test for them, but sometimes if it's severe or young patients, we do. Uh, but by and large, I would recommend that those children of the people who have uh, glaucoma at that later age be, be checked and have yearly eye exams. And on a related note, uh, John Wing submitted a question. Is low normal tension glaucoma also more prevalent in Asians? Yeah, that's a good question. From, from what I know, I do not believe there's an association with, with what we call normotensive. Um, I, that's largely what we call it. We don't really call it low, low tension or low, low pressure glaucoma, although that's really what it is. It's patients that have a normal pressure, just like you check your blood pressure, but then you have all the damage to your blood vessels that you would see in high blood pressure. That is really what we're talking about in the eye. So we check the eye pressure. Usually it's between 7 and 21. And patients could have a pressure of 14, which it, we would usually say is completely normal, but we see the changes to the optic nerve that look like glaucoma. And those are the patients we call normal tension or normal pressure glaucoma. Uh, as far as I know, there's no uh, connection with uh, Asians and normal tensive. Good to know. Uh, going on to our next question. Are there eye drops that would help to improve vision? Hmm. So when, when we talk about vision, <laughs> I'm going to assume and address the question that is, are we talking about, uh, well, let me break it down. So let's talk about myopia first. So most people think, okay, I had poor vision uh, due to myopia, nearsightedness. There are potentially some drops that can address vision. We don't have particularly any drops now that can um, uh, improve myopia other than there's something like what we call atropine. And there's a whole range of drugs that are coming out like this that are being, that are in clinical trial for children. And to see that we put in a drop, it changes how the, um, the lens uh, focuses and it basically stimulates the eye. This is the theory uh, to not grow as long. And it's thought that if we give these eye drops to children who both parents wear glasses, that they are less likely to need to wear glasses or the power will be less. So their eye will not grow as long. So there are clinical trials like that ongoing. There are eye drops that also are thought to address 
keratoconus. I didn't talk about this entity, but it's an un, uh, abnormally shaped cornea. It's very common as well. And there are eye drops that are thought to change the shape of the cornea that way. And then finally, there are eye drops now <laughs> that affect many, many different uh, diseases. Almost all of, I'd say 80% of treatments for the eye are eye drops. And um, they, they help vision, even uh, our artificial tears that clear the surface and keep the eye clean. Um, in order to have a well-functioning uh, well functioning eye, it must be wet, nicely wet. And often people will have blurry vision because of dry eye. In California with our fires and it being very, very dry, 80% um, of my patients have some dryness. So almost everyone, if they find that their eyes are irritated, uh, they're reading or watching TV, we blink much less. Uh, you may want to just get an over-the-counter eye drop like Refresh or um, Sustain. I, I have no financial uh, interest <laughs> in any of these companies um, and just put a drop in. And if that helps you, that might just be all it is. But I urge you, if you have continued eye problems, please see an eye doctor, an eye specialist, to just get a checkup and, and get a professional opinion. Great. Um, next question. Macular puckers, are they common in Asians or just in myopia? And kind of to follow up on that, are there side effects to macular pucker surgery? Yeah, so, so macula or macular pucker, for those of you who, who aren't familiar, macula is a part of the retina. It's really where the light is focused and it is involved in your central vision, the most important vision. Um, Pucker, just like you know, you pucker your mouth, is when it tightens up and you have um, essentially tightening of a structure. Imagine you have a sheet and you pull on the sheet, you see folds and waves in the sheet, and that is the puckering. When the retina, when that happens to the retina, um, your vision is distorted. So imagine a, a film in the camera, and instead of the film being a flat piece, it's all kind of wavy. So you're not going to have a clear image that way. The way that often that's addressed is um, potentially surgery, potentially laser. There are a number of different ways. But anytime you do surgery on the retina, there is risk. It is a, I would put it within the moderate um, to, <laughs> to uh, high risk category. And I, I believe my retinal uh, colleagues would, would agree. You don't want to be operating in your eyeball on the retina willy nilly. So. You want to only go in if you think that you can really help a patient's vision. And because it's so sensitive, it's packed with photoreceptors. And, it can, and a photoreceptor is an exquisite uh, part of the eye that can detect one photon of light. So the type of surgery we do to the retina is uh, while micro, micro, very, very small, any changes, any changes that are done to the retina Will cause significant could cause significant change in your vision. So I would recommend if you're considering macular pucker surgery that you discuss that with your retinal surgeon. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but I would imagine one in ten to one in twenty patients will have visual uh, sequelae from uh, a retinal surgery. But but don't quote me on that number. Um, I think there was a, well, did I answer the question fully, or was there more parts to that question, uh, Dr. Hong? Uh, I think you answered that pretty well. So you definitely answer the side effects to the macular pucker. And then um, is it as common or more common than myopia? Oh, yes. It, uh, I, it is certainly more common in myopia. So as I mentioned, uh, and certainly in high myopia. So for, for those of you who don't know, um, but maybe you know the, the prescription on your contact lens box or your glasses, General myopia is largely considered minus five or minus six and, and lower. So minus one, minus two. Um, many people have minus three, minus four. That is your nearsighted. You definitely can't see the blackboard. You can't really uh, watch a movie in a theater without your glasses and without contacts. Minus one or minus two, you might be able to if you sit very close. But anything greater than minus six is really what we call high myopia. And anything greater than minus nine is what we call pathologic myopia. And occasionally we see people who are wearing very, very thick glasses. You, you know, you're looking at them in their glasses and their eye looks smaller or bigger and looks a little bit funny. Those are, the, the, those are usually our friends or our family that have high or pathologic myopia. Those people 
or if, or if it's you, uh, are at increased risk for macular pucker, for retinal detachment. And I highly recommend you see um, a ret retinal doctor uh, probably once a year to check in on that. Great. Um, switching gears a little bit, what preventative measures are good? Does wearing sunglasses help protect your vision? And kind of uh, combining some other questions, as we look at the computer and smartphone screens all day, how is that expected to affect our eyesight in the long term? What should we do to protect our eyes? Uh, and then any eye supplements that are beneficial, lutein, oh, great. bilberry. So, so you may have to remind me, so I'll hit upon yeah, the first yeah. part. Okay, <laughs> so actually, so the first part is, um, Preventative measures. Pre preventative measures, okay. So I cannot stress this enough. The most common times that we injure the eyes are at home. Mm. And oftentimes people don't think about it, but anytime you look up and you're doing any work above, you should be wearing eye protection. It's very, very cheap now. You can get a clear, very comfortable pair of protective glasses off Amazon, delivered to your home <laughs> for $3, $5, um, again, I have no financial interest in Amazon, but, but please, um, or, or just at Home Depot, just get as something to protect your eyes. People change, uh, are, are changing a light bulb and there's a little bit of dust that have accumulated on that light bulb and they fall into, our, into the eye um, because you don't expect it. So any type of work at home, um, certainly tree work, outdoor work, uh, mowing the lawn, a little bit of, of dust, of tree, of, of grass can get in the eye and it can get caught or can get in, in, in lodged in the eye and cause you problems. So I highly recommend any power tools, any type of construction work, please, please, please. Um, I'm the, a, uh, an, uh, an orbital surgeon and I would, I, I'm not gonna recount, but I've removed unfortunately people's eyes uh, due to injuries like this. Okay, so please for children uh, and then for sports. So all racket sports, squash, racquetball, tennis, um, it, uh, all types of, of things where they're high projectiles that can get into the eye, please wear eye protection. That's my recommendation. Uh, preventative measures. Uh, you mentioned uh, smartphones and devices. I, I hear this all the time in questions all the time. And I have small children. So I wonder as well, Right now, um, I have had parents come in and say, Dr. Wu, please tell my teenage son he should not be using, or teenage daughter, he shouldn't be on the, the smartphone, it's bad for his eyes or her eyes. Now, as much as I want to tell them that, there unfortunately isn't any, any data that have connected smartphone use to uh, damage to the eye. So that's actually a good thing. Now, as much as we may want to tell our teenagers, get off your phone, it's hurting your eyes, um, it's a good thing because the world is using uh, tablets and smart devices right now. And it's good that it's not, as far as we know, causing any damage. So from the radiation or the light, et cetera. So as far as we know, there's no damage from that. Of course, you can have eye strain. So I, I tell all my patients, if you're uh, studying for finals or if you're doing hard work, you can get what we call spasm of the eye. So it does take muscle and strength. And if you're constantly looking hard at something for an hour or two, that can cause strain. So I do recommend patients every half hour, take a break from your studying or your work and look far away. So look out the window and, and just relax, breathe, stretch, but look and relax the eyes by looking far away. Just imagine you're looking close. It takes energy, just like you're holding something up. Take a break and give those muscles a little time to relax. Uh, and then I'll touch upon the, uh, the vitamins and supplements. So as far as we know, we don't know of any supplements that improve vision. Now, in the, the pre pretty much the only study that has been shown to improve or to stop disease is a macular de degeneration study. So those who are at risk for moderate to severe macular degeneration, not even mild, there is a supplement uh, called the A-RED supplement. It's, it's a, a study supplement name that you can get in the uh, pharmacy that has a, a high dose of vitamin D. Uh, there's A in there, there's lutein, beta, beta carotene, a few different things in there that are thought to be antioxidant and can um, decrease the progression of macular degeneration. I, rec I would recommend it actually for mild patients as well 
if uh, you know you were my uncle or aunt or, or father or mother or something like that, even though the data isn't really there. Um, but of course, it may stop it if, it's, if it becomes moderate. But for those of us in the community, otherwise healthy, uh, there are no supplements that are known to improve vision. Now, that being said, there are a few things that are thought to improve a dry eye. So um, if you have dry eyes, which is very, very common, flaxseed oil, omega-3 oils, fish oils, um, I recommend to patients because that improves the quality of your tears. And it actually improves likely the quality of the, of the oils on your body. So if you have a dry skin, it would improve that too. So in terms of supplements, I often recommend um, uh, flaxseed oil, uh, omega-3 oils, uh, fish, uh, fish oils. And then to address the um, whether sunglasses can help protect our vision and then are also Asian eyes more susceptible to light like LED lights. Okay, so let me ask, let me answer the first part because as far as I know that there's no uh, increased susceptibility for Asian eyes for um, as far as I know any any of the light types. And in fact, it might be slightly protective. Uh, those with very fair, let's just say blue eyes, it's thought that those eyes are more sensitive to light, uh, largely the pigment, the darker, you, most Asians have brownish or darker eyes um, that can absorb the light and be protective as far as we know. Uh, protective in terms of for uh, eye sensitivity, let's just put it that way. Sunglasses, yes, yes, yes. So we do know that, for example, in North America, the, there are more cataracts in patients' left eyes and then in their right eyes. And it's largely through epidemiological studies been shown that because we drive, dr the drivers are on the left side of the car, <laughs> that more light and there's more UV coming in the left eye, people get cataracts more commonly in the left eye. So UV light is known to cause cataract damage or cause potentially speed the, the formation of cataract. UV is also known to be damaging to the surface of the eye and the retina. So I recommend all patients, you know you're going out. The, mo the best thing is of course a, a cover type protection. So a hat, so the light doesn't even get there. But if light, if you're not wearing a hat or if the angle of the light comes directly in the eye, please wear uh, UV protecting uh, sunglasses to, to help you. And that will also protect from dust and other things that might get in the eye when you're outside. So yes, definitely. Okay, so the, um, next question. How close are we to eye transplant, say for macular degeneration? Yeah, so um, I'm kind of deeply involved in that. We, we, my lab uh, is interested in transplantations of certain parts of the eye and potentially whole eye transplant. I suspect whole eye transplants, we won't see for at least 20 or 30 years probably, um, but we will see certainly parts of the eye being transplanted um, and, and it's transplants are occurring uh, right now. So corneal transplants, the cornea was actually the first transplant ever, ever uh, successfully performed over hundred years ago, largely because the eye is thought to be what we call immuno uh, privileged. It, 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 its immune response is somewhat blunted compared to the rest of the body. But let's talk about the retina. Um, there are uh, clinical trials ongoing for uh, cells that are made to address macular degeneration. There are clinical trials for stem cells for the front of the eye. Right now, in, in uh, my laboratory at Stanford, we are taking patients' uh, skin or their blood, a little sample or a, a blood draw, and we're able to change those blood cells into stem cells. And over the course of about two to three months, we are actually able to create mini eyes in a dish. So it's the patient's own cells and we create mini eyes. So those mini eyes we can take and we can take cells from those mini eyes in a dish and we can potentially transplant them to cure uh, macular degeneration or corneal damage. And that's what we're actively working on right now. So it's on the horizon. Uh, our department is one of the leaders in uh, this type of therapy. We have pe uh, people, two or three great researchers who are working on retinal chip so potentially implanting a chip that can detect light and direct that directly to the optic nerve for, for those with macular degeneration. So we're addressing uh, macular degeneration and other forms of blindness uh, in various ways, 
uh, all trying to cure blindness and restore vision in patients. Wow, very exciting. Kind of um, on the same lines, how long before there's stem cell treatment for diseases like glaucoma to reverse damage? Yeah, glaucoma, uh, we have, uh, including our chairman and a number of other wonderful researchers in our group are focused on glaucoma treatments. Um, I would say that we are getting close. There are ways to rescue and protect the optic nerve with stem cells. There are ways that we're trying to address the increased intraocular pressure in, what we, in the area called the, the angle, the trabecular meshwork. Um, so we're looking at different ways to decrease pressure and different ways to decrease the damage done from uh, increased pressure on the optic nerve. The one of the greatest bottlenecks or the greatest challenges is we don't know how to regenerate nerve very well. So just like brain, we can't really create a brain. There are a number of researchers at Stanford who have many kind of mini brains in a dish and we're working with them to put a mini eye next to a mini brain in a dish and hope that an optic nerve will grow between the two of them. That's called a, a assembloid. It's really cutting edge uh, research that we're uh, thinking about and we're hoping to do in the future. Uh, I think that these things are, are on the horizon. They're not uh, science fiction uh, from 20, 30 years ago. We're, it's something that we can see steps to get there and hopefully uh, have treatments, regenerative treatments for patients. Oh, very exciting. Seems like very cutting edge. Um, we'll do maybe one more question. So um, a couple of questions uh, about your opinions regarding LASIK for myopia, and then also the difference between PRK and LASIK and why you would choose one versus another. Wonderful. This is one of the most common things that I talk about at, at, at cocktail parties and whatnot, uh, because it's so common. And I, I'll say I had LASIK my, uh, myself. So I have uh, have 20 years of wonderful uh, vision. I haven't had to wear glasses, uh, swimming or doing a, a athletics. So as a patient uh, and as a physician, I think it's a wonderful therapy. Um, so I'll, I'll sum it up very quickly. LASIK is where you create a flap in the cornea. So if this is the cornea, you create a little flap area that you then treat the bed and then you put the flap back down. If this is the eyeball, PRK is where you basically shave the front of the, eye, the cornea and you don't create a flap. There are pros and cons with both, but in a nutshell, LASIK is usually more comfortable. PRK, because you've shaved the front of the eye, the, the cornea, it can be about a week of five to eight pain where you need painkillers. The benefit of not having a flap is that if you create a little cap on the cornea, it could get dislodged and that is a problem. So there are certain things like if you do contact sports, rock climbing, et cetera, you would not want to have a flap. Scuba diving? Uh, uh, scuba diving potentially because of pressure, pressure differences, uh, PRK could be better. I would recommend uh, LASIK or PRK for anyone who has uh, a prescription likely between minus one and minus eight. Uh, so that's a, that's many patients, even those with high with high uh, high myopia, very bad prescription. Those that have very very high, you need to remove and essentially laser ablate, remove parts of the cornea so much that you destabilize the eyeball. So uh, imagine something is too thick, you need to thin it out in order to get the light refracted correctly. But if you make it too thin. Uh, you, the shape of the eye can get go all wacky and you have a lot of trouble. So I would not generally recommend it for patients that have very high myopia. Uh, but I would recommend that you talk to your LASIK specialist. If you have a very thick cornea or you have a very thin cornea, that can also change your prognosis. So if your cornea is particularly thin, uh, you may not have much room to work with for LASIK or PRK. So uh, Dr. Ed, Ed Manchi is the LASIK specialist at, at Stanford. There are many uh, wonderful specialists in the community, but I'd recommend uh, Dr. Manchi. He's a wonderful doctor if you're interested in that, in that therapy. All right. Yeah, we had a lot. Um, we had several more questions that I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to get to tonight, but thank you so much for such a wonderful talk and uh, lovely Q&A session answering a uh, wide variety of questions for us. Um, I think we are at time, so I think we'll call it a night. Thank you all for attending, and thank you, Dr. Wu, for a lovely educational talk. And um, everyone has his email if uh, they have any other further questions to address to him.
Thank you, Dr. Hong. I appreciate you moderating. Thank you all. Of course.